This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, November 2nd edition of the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatal, back with you live from Santa Anita. Just walked in from Chili Clocker's Corner to find a conference room in the bowels of this wonderful facility at Santa Anita. Joined today by the usual crew, plus a special guest. Starting with, we're going to do this in a different order than we usually do, because I'm going to first introduce the man at the other end of this oval-shaped conference room. He is not in Planet Texas today. He's in Planet California. He's Jonathan Kinchy. Yeah, our, our, our buddy Nate Newby let us use the uh, conference room here at, uh, at at Santa Anita in the marketing office. Actually, he told me we could use it, but he's he's not he's not here today yet. So Pete and I uh, just uh, roamed around on our own and kind of snuck in here, and we close the door, and hopefully no one kicks us out. There is a chance that we're going to have a repeat of the Keeneland situation where security guards interrupt us in the middle of the show. If we end up in jail, we, you guys can all chip in and post our bail. We also have the other <laughs> member of the usual crew from the DRF offices in New York, Mike Hogan. No, no, from the uh, home in Forest Hills, uh, Mike Hogan, because today I've got the podcast live. I've got two live webinars. I've got a construction office slash uh, I don't know what's going on over there. So I said, look, I'm going to I'm going to stay home. I'm going to get a quiet spot. I know I'm not going to be interrupted. The worst thing we have to possibly deal with is if the mail shows up and the doorbell rings, my dog will bark. We can we, we've dealt with that before. That, that's the situation. <laughs> uh, usually mugs the Labrador making her handicapping selections through the power of barking. We also have today our special guest, as I mentioned before. He's the original host of this show. Not only that, a fantastic racing analyst. If you've been following his work on NBC, I don't have the official record here, but I saw somebody on Twitter send out something like uh, 9 of 22 this year in picks given out on the NBC show. We'll ask him to corroborate that fact. Matt Bernier. Matt, how are you today? Good, boys. What's going on? I can't, I can't confirm that number. Uh, I, all I'll say is Blind Squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. <laughs> That's an awful lot of nuts. I, I, I'm pretty, I'd be pretty pleased with that, uh, that amount of nut production. But what we're going to do on the show today, we're going to do all of Friday's Breeders' Cup races, and then we're going to pick up with the beginning of the Saturday card. We'll do the first three races, and then tomorrow at the same time, Jonathan, Mike, and I will be the guests on – the regularly scheduled uh, Matt Bernier show, and we will do the pick six on uh, on Breeders' Cup Saturday. So we're going to go through all the Breeders' Cup races in detail. And uh, without further ado, I think we should just dive right in and uh, get going with the fourth race on Friday from Santa Anita. It's the BC Juvenile Phillies. Matt, as our, uh, as our special guest, we're going to let you start with this one. You can talk about it in terms of your general affinity for the race. Is it a race you plan on betting? Um, and regardless of whether it's going to be an important part of your Breeders' Cup Friday, we'd just love to get your general thoughts here in the in, – in the, uh, I said it wrong, didn't I? <laughs> I put the wrong race in front of me. Uh, we're not going to start with talking about the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. We're going to start talking about the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, the sixth race on Friday. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's a really, I think it's a wide open race. I, I talked to Jonathan really briefly last night, and I, I don't, I feel like this is a race, particularly the two turf juvenile races on Friday. I, I don't think there's anyone really that you can just go through first pass and just draw a line through and say you've got no shot and just completely throw them out. I won't be surprised if there's a 40 to one shot that wins this race, and I won't be surprised if the favorites come through. I think it's wide open. It's very, very interesting. The Europeans coming over seem like, they're good. They're not superstars, though. Uh, at this point, and, and Pete, you can speak better to this than I can. Um, the big horse, the big two-year-old over there, it sounds like his name is Churchill. And Lancaster Bomber, who figures to be one of the choices in this race, has essentially been his rabbit throughout the early course of his career. Now it looks like they'll try to win this race with him. It's not a race I have a very strong opinion with. I I've treaded lightly as far as assigning values to these horses. I don't anticipate any sort of a win wager, but, you know, this is the kickoff leg of a couple different big wagers, whether it's a pick three or a pick four. 
Um, I'm, I'm sure I'll have some sort of action, but it's not a race that I have a, a just an incredibly strong opinion in. I ended up going with one of the Europeans for Aiden O'Brien. I went with Intelligence Croft that just feel like you look at the pedigree, I would, I would imagine he's going to stretch a little bit more, even though there's a little bit more sprint influence here. Um, I just I liked everything about the way that he finished most recently. He's faced some decent enough competition over there. And I think he's going to get an honest pace to run at. I don't think he has to come from 150 out of it. I think he's going to be somewhere in the middle of the pack. And if he's good enough, he's good enough. Aiden O'Brien and Ryan Moore, they've teamed up to win three of the past five runnings in this race. So uh, he's not going to make your day necessarily from an odd standpoint, but I went with intelligence cross. Very sensible pick and certainly one of the ones on my short list as well. Jonathan, how about you? How are you approaching this race in general? And who are your specific Specific selections for selection? You know, I, I got on the airplane thinking that Good Samaritan was going to be one of my strongest opinions, and then I started looking at Oscar performance a little bit har- harder, and I, and I kind of fell in love with him. I, you know, I, I can't give one choice because I think that those two horses are, are really the most likely two winners in the race. Um, I think that this is kind of the, the race that the Euros kind of hold the, the lightest hand, and, and so for Good Samaritan, for me, it's going to be Good Samaritan and Oscar performance. I'm going to try to key those horses and trifectas in every spot, you know, 11 with 13, 11, 13 with 11, 13 with the logical horses and then move those around. And essentially what I'm saying is I think that they're both going to hit and the try and hope that I can get a price in there. Um, you know, my price, there's two price plays that I'm interested in using uh, in here underneath that I think will present some value. The first one is keep quiet. Um, can't argue kind of what that horse did in, in, in the, in the bourbon. That was an impressive race. Um, you know, Keep it quiet, but that horse has been working with Classic Empire on the dirt and uh, was even the workmate for Teppin. So that the, the confidence that they have in that horse as a two-year-old to work uh, with those types of horses is something that caught my attention and is a horse that I'll definitely consider using underneath. And then uh, I've been working on it, and I, I keep saying it as much as I can when I'm around Pete. I'm trying to convince him he's not really letting me do it. But I think Well Abled uh, has a chance at, at a piece at a huge price on this turf course uh, going to the front. Um, being by Shackelford, um, the, the dam produced a, a winner of the San Juan Capistrano, so the distance shouldn't be an issue. Uh, so those are kind of my, my, my bomb plays for, for underneath. But on top, it's uh, Good Samaritan and Oscar performance. I think it's I think pronounced it's well a bled, Jonathan. I, think. <laughs> I, heard that, I heard that on a podcast somewhere. Um, uh, my two cents on this race, I definitely uh, – Matt's pick on my short list. I'm a, I'm a Good Samaritan guy. I uh, was in the paddock for both of his previous races. Very much impressed physically. Looked like uh, looked like a serious racehorse right from the jump. Um, obviously, went on a more galloping course last time at Woodbine, but showed he could navigate the tight two-turn layout at uh, current prices available in the UK of six to one. Uh, that that's very interesting. I think it will be shorter here, but hopefully, isn't going to be hellaciously overbet. Mike Hogan, who is it for you in this race? Well, I agree with Matt um, almost entirely in the sense that I think you can make a case for everybody in this race. Um, And I think that Good Samaritan will probably be favored, if not, or at least among the American runners. Um, And I'm generally against him. I'm generally against Oscar uh, Oscar performance. So I I think I'm kind of going against Jonathan here, uh, partly just from a value standpoint. I can make a case for so many that I don't want to take ones that I think are going to be a little bit overbet and have some question marks for me. Uh, good Samaritan obviously is a very, very good horse. They were thinking the juvenile for him, and I know they're thinking dirt later for him. They've got la- they've got bigger goals in mind. It doesn't mean he's not going to win, but I think he's going to be overbet. Bill Mott has never won a Breeders' Cup race with a juvenile. He's 0 for 11. Five of them were 5 to 1 or lower. Most recently, let's think about Puka how overbet she was. Let's think about Harmonize last year. Um, He's also not even hit the board in the last five years in a grade one with a juvenile. They've got bigger plans. He may be just good enough to win anyway, but uh, I think he's going to be overbet. He's not going to provide the value, especially in such a wide open race. The bomb that I like is actually the horse that ran third to him in the summer last out. Um, My note for him in, in my, in formulator, my trip note for him just says, Mr. Toad. I'm talking about number three channel maker. You know, if if Good Samaritan might be your favorite, you're going to get almost 10 times the price on channel maker. And arguably, he ran almost as well. Probably wasn't as good as Good Samaritan was in there, but he had all kinds of trouble. 
He only only beaten three lengths. It was his first time routing. He should stretch out by all means. And I also looked through. I did I did some deep research. Daniel Vela. Do you want to guess the last time Daniel Vela had a runner in Southern California? Anyone? I'm stumped. It was 1993 in the Hollywood Derby. A horse named Explosive Red won at 22 to one. So uh, I, I think Daniel Vela is gonna gonna. I don't know if he's going to win. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. But I'm going to be using him in all kinds of combinations. And if he does, uh, you, you know, I'll have a few bucks on him. All right. Let's move on to the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Mike, we'll keep it with you. What are your thoughts on this race? Is Portman the, the short price standout that many think he is? Or is this a place to get clever? You know, it, for me, it comes down to two. Uh, I, I really only think one of two horses is going to win. It's going to be either Dortmund. Uh, or it's actually going to be possibly run happy. I mean, I know uh, he's a little bit of a joke for some people, and certainly he's probably better spotted in the sprint. If you were the sp- in the sprint, he, he might be uh, odds on here. Um, but obviously they have bigger plans in mind. They want the Pegasus for him. And all things considered, he didn't run too poorly last out in the ACAC in his first start in 10 months, almost nine plus months. He had to duel with Mr. Z, who was not going to win that race. He was in there. Basically, I mean, Mr. Z is never going to win. He, his, his whole job is to really just soften up uh, pace setters. He did that there. Run Happy actually held on decently. He galloped out nicely. I think he'll be fitter. He'll move forward. And there's a very good chance that he's a length or two clear on the turn uh, and on the backstretch. And if he's clear at Santa Anita and the dirt is carrying and you've got a a champion sprinter stretching out fitter than he was last time. He might be good enough to, to, to overcome all of the craziness around him. He was trained by an animal abuser. He's now trained by a furniture salesman. Uh, he may just be good enough to, to, to not stop here. So for me, it's, it's those two and, and everybody else is, is running for second and third. My opinion, real simple, so I'll just get it out of the way. I just think Dortmund, it, it, we talked about it the other day on the podcast, the old fastest horse angle. Uh, that's a case of Dortmund for me. Don't figure to be spending a whole lot of money getting stuck into this race, but I, I just can't. I'm not creative enough to see it any other way. Nobody loves speed like Jonathan Kinchin. Uh, Jonathan, what did you think of Mike's case for Run Happy, and who is your pick in this race? Um, if Run Happy wins, I lose. Um I just I can't I can't uh, I can't support the circus and 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 I just can't believe in the circus. Uh, I, I thought he was he was pretty darn bad last time, and I, I don't look. I, I actually I don't even care. I don't see Laurel Wollers as being the type of horseman that was going to give the horse a race and and that he's going to improve off of that. I, it, if it's Baffert, if it's Todd, if it's Mott, if it's Chad. Yeah. Okay. Great. We're gonna we're gonna improve off of that. That wasn't the goal. Uh, I I just don't feel like her experience is enough in which that that's what happened. I feel like that horse was was ready to run as they were gonna get the horse ready to run, and uh, no good for me. I, look, I get the Dortmund thing. Um, if if I had to make a pick right now, I would pick Vijack. Um, I think Vijack uh, is 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 a talented horse. He's got the dirt form to to support. Uh, him in this race and what he did last time uh, at Santa Anita, breaking the track record, albeit a, on a on a, what 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 has been known as a putting green. Uh, it's still it's an impressive situation. I think Damato will move the horse up um, out here in California, and, and he's one that I'll be using uh, definitely, and, and, and Dortmund as well. But uh, my my price play here is Tamara Cruz. Um, just been impressed with his races this year. Interested to watch him around two turns, um, and and so I'll use him a little bit underneath. Matt. Wait, wait a minute, wait, 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 real, real quick, Jonathan. Vijack has the dirt form. When was his last dirt win? Well, I mean, it's been a while. <laughs> it was. It was. I, he, I'll answer that for you. It was but, September twenty seventh, two thousand fourteen. Right, but what I'm saying is, is he's not a he's not a, a turf horse who's gonna just they're gonna just they're popping him on the dirt. He ran in he ran in a three or four horse race against Masochistic, where Masochistic had an unbelievable pace advantage. Ran well enough, first off of a break, first time for Damato. And and it, is he not a grade one win? Is he he's a grade one winner on dirt? Oh, yeah. he not? oh sure. Oh sure. But but I mean so I, I think, I, think if you win, I think if you win a grade one on dirt at any point of your career, 
then it's you're allowed to say that you have dirt for him. <laughs> oh, that's fair. But I, let, I think uh, let, I'm going to interrupt this and let Matt right, Bernier right. settle the argument. Are you pro or anti Vijack in the dirt mile? And what are your thoughts generally in the race? No, I, look, I, I pick Vijack. I, I think he's got a big chance in this race. I, I may be in the minority. I don't think Run Happy ran terribly at Churchill. I just think it was a combination of long layoff, ridiculous pace, and I just don't think he wants to go this far. Now, look, Santa Anita, uh, I was talking to you, Pete, on the plane last night coming out here. The the track profile, the way that route races on the main track have played, you need to be very, very close to the pace. There was significant rainfall here on Sunday. I, I'm hopeful that didn't completely throw everything off. We've seen in the past that that can change things a little bit, but speed is paramount going two turns at Santa Anita. So run half, he's going to be out there. I don't think... Ultimately, he's going to be able to see out the distance. Dortmund wants to be forwardly placed. I, I can't help but think the two of them are going to hook up at some point. I need Flavian Pratt to get by Jack out of the gate. You go two back. Like Jonathan said, look, he got buried by Masochistic. I'm not going to hold that against him. Masochistic might be one of the fastest horses that we've got going. Yeah, I think if Vijack can get in some sort of, like, basically sit the pocket trick, using a harness turn, sit in just behind those two. If Run Happy spits it, turn it for home. I don't love Dortmund. Look, he's I think he's the most likely winner, but I I can't back him at four to five or even money. I just he, he doesn't do anything for me at that price. Especially when it just sounds like Baffert had him cranked up, ready to go. And he almost went as far as to say that the awesome again was their Breeders' Cup. This almost seems like an afterthought. I think Vijack's coming into this in good form. Obviously that turf race was was giant and, and I think he's done well enough on the dirt in the past. Um Vijack's a pick, and he'll probably be worth a small win wager for me. All right. I'm going to go first in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf. I have a pretty strong opinion here. Didn't get the best of the draw, but I'm hoping that just means we get a little bit of a better price on number 13, Roly Poly. I was very impressed by the race in the Cheveley Park, cutting out multiple sub-11 second eights, having to do the dirty work against Lady Aurelia, who ended up uh, bleeding and not firing her best race anyway in that race. But, I mean, I think Lady Aurelia was looking like she was going to be a strong favorite for this race uh, before that incident. I just thought Roly Poly ran the best race in a legitimate new market, Group 1. That's form that's good enough to win a running of this race. There are others I'm going to use, but my top preference is definitely with Roly Poly. Jonathan, will throw it to you next for your thoughts on the Juvenile Philly Turf. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take your 13 and raise you one, and and, and take the 14 with uh, La Coronel. You know, I'm don't get me wrong, I'm using Roly Poly as well. It, it's a it's an A and you know one A and one you know one deal for me. I, I just I thought La Coronel's races have been ultra impressive. Um, I think when you look through this race, uh, one of the horses that you have to consider, and, and one of the horses that you have to look at is uh, New Money Honey, and it's one of those six degrees of separation deal for me, and. I bet New Money Honey last time because of the way she ran against La Cornell. La Cornell has continued to impress off of, of what she's done, what she did at Keeneland, I, I thought was 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 remarkable. And uh, New Money Honey has flattered La Cornell, and I think she's the real deal. I think that uh, she's uh, this year's version of, of Catch a Glimpse, and I think they're going to have a lot of fun with this with this horse. And and I just hope that that Flo can somehow find a way to. Uh, to, to channel Ryan Moore a little bit and, and get this 14 hole to not be a problem. Referring, of course, to Moore's brilliant ride on Hit It a Bomb last year. And it's funny you say that, Jonathan, about the Catch a Glimpse comparison because Florent Giroux himself made that comparison uh, to somebody on the Cassie team in the immediate aftermath of, of La Cornell's last win, winning race. Uh, we have another Catch a Glimpse on our hands. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, let's go to Mike Hogan back in New York. Mike, who did you come up with in here? Well, I generally agree with you guys. I think this race is a lot less wide open than the juvenile turf. Uh, I think the, the, the key players are the two Aiden O'Brien runners, uh, Hydrangea on the rail, who um, at least, you know, intricately beat her by a nose, two back, intricately may take more money, uh, trained by Aiden's son, of course, Joseph O'Brien, uh, I think Hydrangea might be a little overlooked here and was only beaten in nose. Uh, I would use equally with um, Roly Poly and La Coronel, who I think is, is by far the best of the Americans. And maybe that draw just helps your price, kind of like what we saw last year with Hit It a Bomb. Uh, 
the only other thing I'll mention, surprisingly enough, found is the only filly that uh, Aiden O'Brien has ever won a Breeders' Cup race with. Uh, so he's never won the Juvenile Phillies turf. He's 0 for 7 here um, in that race. Uh, I think he's got a good shot this year. The, the one long shot play that I'll be using to try and spice up the exotics is number six, Coasted. Uh, I think you can forgive the last effort on the yielding turf at Belmont. And other than those, that effort uh, has done absolutely nothing wrong since stepping on the turf. Uh, I think might be a little overlooked in the wagering, partly because I think a lot of people will focus on the fact that New Money Honey uh, beat her handily last out. So um, that's it for me. Matt, we'll let you bat clean up on this one. Who's your pick in the juvenile Philly turf? I'm going to take a little bit of a shot here. You know, Jonathan brought up the New Money Honey race. Uh, I'm going to go with the horse that she beat pretty handily, Rimska, the 11. She's 20 on the line. Uh, You listen to Chad Brown. Chad's come out and said it just seems like this filly is improving and maybe she's gotten over the ship from France over here. I don't think she was embarrassed in that race at Belmont. I I saw all things considered over the ground. Maybe it was a little bit less than what she would prefer. I feel like they're only here for the the firmer going. And uh, kind of a spoiler alert, you'll find this out soon enough when you get the clock report from Mike Welsh and Mike Vesci, she outworked New Money Honey the other day up at Belmont Park. So it seems like she's coming into this in good form. She's getting Lasix for the first time. Depending on certain figures, whichever you use to handicap, she fits with many of the domestic hopes. I think La Coronel is a tremendously talented horse. Won't be surprised at all if she wins. I picked her second just because of the draw. I think it's going to be a difficult to, for her to sort of work things out. Um, I, I just think Rimsk is a little bit of an intriguing horse simply because I think she can sort of make that next move forward, whereas some of these other fillies, New Money Honey, I'm not suggesting that we've seen the best of her by any stretch, but I don't know that you're going to get a giant jump forward from her, whereas I think the, the jump forward for this filly could be significant enough where maybe she doesn't win, but I think she could certainly hit the board at a giant number. I'm going to pick her and I'll better at 20-1. to 1. Very interesting way to go in there, Matt, uh, for sure. We, Matt and I had some fun last night. We flew out. We did the, the great Burbank uh, flight in from JFK, made everybody on the plane crazy, rearranging seats so we could sit next to each other and talk about all these races while watching that blowout of, of a ball game. But uh, So I've, I have a little bit of a sneak preview into his feelings about some of these races, and we're going to let him lead off with a race that Mike, Jonathan, and I have already discussed ad nauseum on the show. Um, <laughs> we can give our official picks, but I, I don't want to totally get into the, the – weeds on it we'll let the we'll let the the, the guest uh have first crack at the breeders cup distaff incredible race from a sporting point of view um one of the things i'm looking forward to seeing the most matt is this a race first of all is this a race you anticipate better uh no it, it's not and i'll go back to what you guys have discussed mike hogan came over to us last week and brought up the fact that you, Pete, and Jonathan both acknowledged that you thought this was the worst opinion Mike's ever had. I agreed. We'll dive into it a little bit more <laughs> simply from from a percentage standpoint. Um, I Look, I don't have a, a super interesting opinion in here. I think Songbird drew on the rail. I think she was controlling speed regardless of where she drew. Now if she's on the rail, they're certainly going to go on with her. I already mentioned how the main track in two-turn races at Santa Anita has been playing over the autumn meet. I think she goes out there, and I think on the far turn, look, we're going we're gonna to find out pretty, pretty quick whether or not this is going to be sort of the passing of the torch where Songbird is going to be the one that goes on with it, or we're going to find out pretty quick that, you know what, all of the figures are accurate, and she's never run a race nearly fast enough to run with Beholder and Stellar Wind. There's a part of me that just feels like, and, and Pete, obviously, you, you know a little bit, we talked about it, this, to me, just feels more and more like a few years back here at Santa Anita when Beholder defeated Royal Delta. And it was, you know, Royal Delta wasn't in terrible form coming into the Breeders' Cup. And I'm not suggesting that Beholder's in terrible form. If anything, she's in career form. I just feel like maybe we're at the point now where this filly may be ready to go. I Look, I've, I've been drooling over her since she broke her maiden at Del Mar last year. I think she's just a really, really talented filly. I think she's going to be controlling speed. I made her five to two. I know we'll dive into it with Hogan as far as the odds that he's given her and, and why maybe there's, you know, well, we'll, we'll talk about it. But uh, I went Songbird over Beholder and Teller when that's not original. 
I guess if I needed to take a flyer, it would be on a chatterbox. She seems to be coming in this. I was at Keeneland when she won the uh, the spinster a few weeks back. That, for me, was far and away the best race of her career, and she also doesn't have to come from far out of it. I think she probably tries to glue herself off uh, Songbird's flank. If you needed a bomb, maybe it's her, and I say a bomb, you know, tongue-in-cheek. She might be 10 to 1, but uh, for me, chalky, chalk eater special, but I'm really, really looking forward to this. This may be the race of the weekend. It's going to be very exciting to not be just completely boring. And, and maybe people will think this is completely boring. But for me, if I were approaching this race in a contest like the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge, I'd be really shocked if it's not the big three in the exact. Like, I, I understand um, that there are some other talented fillies in here who have form. I get the smart cases other handicappers have made for forever unbridled to come running late and maybe get a piece. But if I could, if I could, through dutching, get to a situation where I could uh, get any kind of reasonable return on the big three, I think they're really – there might be other Phillies in here who run well in grade ones, but I feel like we have three legitimate grade one plus uh, Phillies in this race. And if you can do the math and come up with a, a decent return – messing around in the exacta with those three that's what i'd do in, in the bcbc jonathan kinchin's actually playing in the bcbc is this a race you anticipate playing in there and how are you going to approach it yeah no I, I i definitely will play this race um i don't know if it's to a fault or not i just I, there's no way i can't um i you know i i kind of went back and forth i got wishy-washy a little bit um from my previous statements that uh, i was going to bet beholder with two fists and part of the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to see how she was working, make sure there was no hidden comments from Mandela about, you know, kind of setting himself up for defeat. Well, she's da 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 da. And I wanted to see where she drew. And I think she drew like absolutely perfect. She's not going to be the hunted. She's going to be the hunter. She's going to sit off and she's going to, she's going to stamp herself, in my opinion, uh, one of the best fillies we've ever seen. Um, and uh, that takes nothing away from Songbird. I, I think Songbird is, is a likely winner. Um, but for me, at the price I'm going to get with Beholder on the trip, she's going to get sitting right outside of her with a target to run at. Uh, I think that she's going to get the job done. Mike Hogan has a lot of good company in being anti-Songbird. We had uh, Andy Beyer on one of the webinars that we did uh, yesterday. And uh, he stopped short of his classic, no shot. But he basically said everything <laughs> but that. Um, very entertaining. If you want to go back and check out the replay of that webinar at uh, drf.com slash YouTube with Bayer and Davidowitz. That was an awful lot of fun. So Mike Hogan in good company. I never really objected, objected to the idea of being anti-Songbird as a betting vehicle. I only objected to the idea that she had a mere 8% chance to win the race. Mike, how has your opinion of this race evolved uh over the course of the last two weeks and where are you with it now well well i'll say this uh, what andy's exact words were, were the number one will not darken any of my tickets <laughs> which i thought was cla- was just perfect <laughs> classic <laughs> he's the best uh yeah um but you know i mean i get matt's point about the 2013 distaff and you know frankly if songbird were the third choice like beholder was in that race i mean she was she was behind uh princess of silmar as the second choice she was behind royal delta as your seven to five favorite if you were getting third choice on on uh, sorry on songbird in the multi-race wagers then you know maybe she provides a little bit of value but for me it is is frankly a value thing you've got a horse stepping up in class for the first time facing older facing really good old i mean i think you know royal delta was no slouch but she was the only real older horse authenticity was in there but royal delta was really the only one that wasn't a 3 year old in that field it was a field of 6 here you've got some legitimate older horses who are coming into this race at the top of their game. And you're telling me that you're going to get six to five or maybe even money on a three-year-old trying those older for the first time. For me, that's, that's where I come from uh, in terms of being against songbird. I'd love for her to win from a fan standpoint because I want to see superstars and she may very well be the next superstar in the game, at least on the Philly side. But uh, you know, I tweeted it out, yesterday she may be on a loose lead she may not stop 
but I know for sure she's never had horses like Behold or Stellar Wind, not to mention even Carolina and I'm a chatterbox and forever unbridled coming at her and trying to pass her. So um, I'm still I'm still generally against her. Maybe eight percent was a was a little harsh, you know, maybe 10 or 12 percent seems more likely. But for me, if it's not one of the top two, I'm going to be using Stellar Wind as my A, Beholder as my B, uh, C's on Carolina. I'm a chatterbox forever unbridled. And if Songbird beats me, then Songbird beats me. And, and I, I just bow to what might be one of the best fillies we've seen in a long time. One point about Songbird I didn't make in our previous conversation that I wanted to about uh, her figures was not only the idea that I sincerely believe that when uh, you, you look at one who always finishes under a double handful, that there's likely more in the tank than, than what we've seen in terms of the figures she's produced, but also the idea of being a three-year-old and the improvement I expect from her uh, as the year goes on, as she approaches full maturity. That's just another point I wanted to make about sure. why I think sure. she's the, the most likely winner in this race. Um, just wanted to and, throw and, that out there. You know, and that play is a, is a play I love to make. You know, if, if we're talking about Beholder in the 2013, where you can project that forward improvement and you're getting a little bit of a price against some proven older ones. But but here, you know, a lot of it comes down to price. We'll talk about a horse in the, in the juvenile that, that to me seems like a very similar type of horse as Songbird. Uh, just albeit from a from a more lightly raced and from a two year old standpoint, you know those are the horses I love to play, and if, if I get a price, then I, I happily do so. Let's use that as the pivot, Mike. To the I hope you were talking about the juvenile fillies because that's the next race. Uh, no, I wanted to. Bring I up. wasn't. All right. Well, I wasn't. Well, sadly, well, your punishment then is you're going to have to talk about the juvenile <laughs> fillies. That's where we're going next. We're moving to Saturday's races. The first Breeders' Cup race is the fourth. It's a mile and a sixteenth on the dirt. Uh, Mike Hogan, what'd you come up with here? Well, you know, I don't know. There's nobody that I really am excited to play or that I completely trust to single here. Uh, you know, uh, Andy Byer made a case for his uh, Byer Speed figure uh, top in Jameson and Ginger, the 103 Byer, if you believe it, stands over the field. And I, I'm not going to say that uh, it, it's not a, a correct figure. It's just some things, you know, w- one turn at Belmont, now shipping to Santa Anita, uh that was in the slop. This is not. Those are the kinds of efforts that, uh, you know, if, if the horse is going to be five, six, seven to one, uh, I'll likely try and have them replicated in order to beat me. So uh, that said, it's it's completely wide open. The one that that appeals to me, the actually the, the New York shipper that appeals to me most uh, is Yellow Agate, who I think might be a, a fair price. Um, has done little wrong in her two starts. Uh, I think we've got uh, some nice upside from her. She'll be a square price. It's a wide open race for me, so I'm going to be using a number of them. Um, she's just the one that I think from a price standpoint prevents, uh, presents the most appeal. Matt Bernier, how do you see this race? Uh, you know, it's an interesting race. And, you know, kind of going back to what you guys were talking about with Andy Byer, you know, Jameson and Ginger is the kind of horse that I'm normally looking at saying fraud. Has fraud written all over, wet track, one turn, basically gate to wire. She sets just off a little bit, I understand. But you go back and look at her run two back, that's kind of what convinced me. I, she had legitimate trouble. She had a bad bobble at the beginning. She came full of run. That was the race when Yellow Agate broke her maiden. That race has come back just ridiculously live. I think five next out winners come out of that one. And you look at the way that this really moves, it's not like, it'd be one thing if, to me, if that was completely out of nowhere. The fact that she ran as well as she did two back makes me think that there may actually be something here. Obviously, her, her damn Ginger Brew, she was a very classy, yeah. really. She was a runner-up in the Queen's play um, as a three-year-old. Against boys, I, I think there are some things here, and kind of going to what Mike was saying, you know, you, you brought up the idea of, well, you know, at six, seven, eight to one, I'll, I'll take a shot against her. I'm almost looking at it the other way, thinking if, if she's legitimately, heck, maybe she's not a 103 buyer kind of horse, but if she's a 90 buyer in a race where I don't think there are any superstars right now, I would almost look at six, seven, eight to one and say, where can I sign up for that right now? If she is that horse, look, I'm not going to argue with anyone that says her two dirt race, she's not fast enough. But there's a part of me that, again, you're trying to project for the two-year-old. It, it, 
it's so often not a matter of what we've seen. It's a matter of what's to come with the two year old. Mm -hmm. You're trying to project what they're going to do. There's a part of me that, that wonders, you know, maybe this Philly is actually a little bit better than people are going to give her credit for at face value because of the wet track, because of Belmont one turn X, Y, and Z. Uh, I think it's a very, very interesting race. Uh, I, I'm going to pick her on top and, and depending on the odds, I'll play her. It, it, she's a fascinating case as far as handicapping dynamics are concerned. I can come back Saturday night looking like an idiot and I can come back Saturday night looking like a genius. And when I say genius, I mean, it, it, this all depends on how much money Andy Byer bets on her because he <laughs> can easily kill the price on her based on the fact that she's just a tremendous overlay as far as the figs are concerned. His figs. God bless That's Andy fair. Byer. You know, he, he's what? amazing. When you, you, you listen to that, you look at the buyer figures, you listen to Andy on the show yesterday, and uh, and the man uh, Matt made this observation to be on the plane. The man bets his figs. It's awesome. Yeah, he's been doing it a long time. He, he clearly believes in what he does. A guy who, with all he's accomplished, could take a back seat, let other people do the work. No, he's in there. He's in the trenches. He's making figures. He's doing the work. He's showing up at the windows, and he's betting them. It's great. Absolutely. One other thing, Matt, I'll say about J- Jameson and Ginger. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm probably not going to be stubborn. It's seven or eight to one, you know, I don't want her to beat me and knock me out of any multi-race, multi-race wagers I might be playing. Although I might just sit this one out and watch. My other concern is just Rudy outside of New York. Uh, he's had a lot of horses just flop at short prices that were expected to run better. Um, so if this horse takes some money, that's when I'm I'm going to try and and beat. If if she gets overlooked, which I don't think she will, um, yeah, then she becomes a little more interesting to me. All right, Jonathan, I want to ask you sort of a side question first. This race, um, by this point, the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge, which you're playing in, will have had uh, a whole lot of a whole, lot of, lot, uh, a whole uh, lot of activity in it, and will be heading uh, into the home stretch essentially with the the actual yeah. Breeders' Cup uh, returning for home, not really the home stretch. Uh, uh, where do you Where want to be in the contest at this point, and how do you see this race factoring into your overall strategy? Oh, to be honest with you, I just want to have some money left at this point. <laughs> the last two, the last few years I've played in this tournament, I've, I feel like I've been on a uh, gradual descent at, at this point. When this, when it comes around to Saturday, and I start reeling, so I'm hoping to make a little bit of money on on Friday, and it, it, you know. If if you could tell me right now that I will have my starting bankroll when I wake up Saturday morning, I would be happy with that and I would sign up for that right now. So that's my hope, um, and we'll just have to see what happens. All right, and what about the specifics of this race? Uh, you know, I started off this week in, in pre-entries where I kind of kept telling people, I don't really love anything. There's some stuff I'm interested in betting. But as I've dug and I've dug and I've worked and I've worked, I'm starting to fall in love with the horse. Uh, my heart wants Dancing Rags to win. Our friend Pipes, uh, the the Darley, uh, Al Al Cibiades, I think is what. Uh, <laughs> I heard that uh, on the podcast too. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, I, you know, I, my heart is with her. Uh, but my uh, BCBC betting card is going to be with Yellow Gate. I, I think that that horse is going to run a huge, huge race here. Um, I have I, to bust uh, your balls for that pronunciation, though. Yes, that indeed. Gate? Yellow Agate? Indeed, Agate? Yellow Agate. Agate. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Yellow Agate. I guess I better get it right before I better. Didn't, um, hey, Matt, didn't you do the same thing? No, I called it Yellow Agate. No, okay. <laughs> I threw a little Spanish flair in there. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Just a little Spanish. Um, I, you know, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow when we talk about the juvenile. And, and uh, I don't want to scream it because I know there's some tournament players that will be listening. But I, 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 I'm I, completely against Cindergard. I'm completely against uh, Practical Joke. I thought the inside was, was really good that day at Belmont. And uh, – Yellow Agate was was uh, was with was against the track that day, and, and, and on figures, it feels like if if there's an improvement uh, based on that track bias, uh, I think she she's uh, the most likely winner of the race, um, even despite Jameson and Ginger's uh, big figure. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, J- J- J.K. You realize that there's a horse in this race trained by Mark Cassie, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure because uh, it seems like every other r- race that there's been a horse trained by Mark Cassie, you were all over. So uh, I'll be honest, you you had it, you, you you had the right idea with the joke, but you, you should have used you should have said the Baffert. It would have made a little bit. Oh, more. okay. 
<laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah. How do you decide, Jonathan, when, when it's, whether it's going to be Cassie yeah. or Baffert? Is it like a dartboard right. thing? Like coin? <laughs> I can especially stamp coin, one with the silver hair and one with sort of the, uh, you know, plaintive Cassie face on there. What do we... or, or you pick a, you pick a flower. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. <laughs> yeah. I just pull off, pull off leaves and see what happens. <laughs> All right, let's all right. move along. Uh, or no, do we all? No, I didn't give my opinion in that race. I I, I buy the yellow agate case. I think uh, there's plenty of pace here, and I think I think she might be the the best closer. So that's where I was gonna go. Um, but I, 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 I my opinion's still evolving when it comes to this race. I also I don't count out the notion, Philly. I mean, Jonathan, the way he. Uh, he, you I, talked about it. It sounded, sounded to me like you didn't like, think uh, you uh, didn't think she had a chance. Yeah. Is, is that right? Is that right? I don't, it's not, uh, I thought I had it muted. Me and Peter in the same room sort of muting back and forth. And I did, actually didn't have it muted. Um, no, it's not that I don't think she doesn't have a chance. It's just, um, you know, figures uh, dictate a lot of what we do. And I just feel like she's just a tad bit light on figures. Um, but you got to remember these are two-year-old fillies and they can improve. Uh, they can make big, big jumps and improvement. So, um, like I said, I'll, I'll be hoping and, 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 and wanting that horse to improve and to run well. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if she did, but it's not one that I'm going to be, uh, s- swiping the, the BCBC betting card at with a lot of aggression. Fair enough. Fair. I think that there'll be plenty of uh, dancing rags on my, on my ticket. So I did want to at least talk about her a little bit more. Let's talk about the fifth race. It's the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Um, Jonathan, we'll keep it with you. Is this the Lady Eli show? You know, this is one of the races that, you know, when Matt and I were talking yesterday on my Uber ride, I, uh, I don't really have much of an opinion. I, I, you know, look, the two Euros, I think, make a lot of sense. Seventh Heaven and Queen's Trust. I think that those two horses are, are live and horses that, you know, that if you were to throw one of them out, I think that would be a dangerous situation. Um, I think Lady Eli is, is, is one of the most remarkable stories that, we've seen and in, in following racing after following as a, as a young fan following or a new fan following Barbaro's situation and what he went through and, 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 and how unfortunate it was what happened to him and to, and to see a horse that kind of went through the same thing. And then to be on this stage to win a grade one and now to be the favorite to win a breeder's cup race after what she went through, I think is just really is something special. So I'll be rooting for her. Um, I think more than a pick, a horse that I am 100% completely against is Catch a Glimpse. And uh, I'm not sure how much money she's going to take. Probably won't be much. But I'm completely against her. And I'm going to try to get a little Al's gal involved in there because I love her. But uh, t- for me, it's the top three. Um, this will. I-, I usually don't say this, but I probably won't bet this race. I'll probably just be watching it. They're running in a circle, Jonathan. I don't know what the problem is. And you're and spoiling the Cassie, Cassie narrative. narrative. You're like, you're, okay. I'm lying. I don't, I don't know why I lie to myself. I'm going to at least bet something on this race, but, um, but it, it, it you know, it just might be, a. uh, you know, what I'll probably do is this is the type of spot where I'll take, uh, I'll take lady Eli and doubles out of her with yellow, uh, yellow Agate. gate. I, I couldn't Agate, get it. Agate, Agate. Gee, yeah, no, you got Agate. Yeah. I, I wanted to say Agate. I'm going to just call her Agate. Who cares? <laughs> You should. Um, you should. I'm then, telling you. I, I thought I was trying to go along the lines of like Ticate, the Mexican beer. Yeah. That was, I hear you. That was the thought. So roll with it, man. <laughs> Let's, they, look, more people saying it makes me right. You're right. <laughs> you can at least get it as an alternative pronunciation, Matt. Matt, uh, in all seriousness, who do you like in this Philly and Mare turf? Is it is it Lady Eli? Is it one of the Euros? Is it something else? Yeah. You know, I have to be honest with you. I I had a hard time. I think all these races for this weekend, Friday and Saturday, as far as the Breeders' Cup races are concerned. I think they're all very, very uh, competitive, let's put it that way. But we've got an NBC betting show coming up. We're taping it later this afternoon. And one of the things that we needed to give was, was sort of a, a likely winner or a most likely winner for us in the weekend. And I, I not just because of the story, I, I do think Lady Eli is the most likely winner of the weekend, for me anyway, more so than Dortmund, more so than California Chrome or anyone else. Um, I think Chad's third off the layoff is huge. I understand it's a different turf course, but she's proven at Santa Anita. I think she's coming up on the best race of her life. And I think in many ways, uh, let's hope it ends in a storybook fashion. She goes out on top. This is the final race of her career. She's retired and she wins, you know, uh, Philly, older turf Philly, as far as the Eclipse Awards are concerned, two-time Breeders' Cup champion. I just think there's so much to like about the story. 
wagering wise, I mean, if you're if you're hell bent on wagering, she's probably not going to help you unless you key her on top and exactas and tries. But um, if you're looking for alternatives, I do like Queen's Trust. I think she's interesting. I think she's coming into this race uh, set up for sort of a peak effort, if you will. She's going to get the Lasix, and I would imagine she moves forward. Um, as far as the other horses in this race are concerned, look, I, the Volvo record is really intriguing to me just because her 2016 form is, is quite poor, I think. I, I don't really have much excuse for some of these races. Maybe she wants every bit of firm going and you want to draw a line for two and th- uh, two back. Her most recent start, I know it was over good going. She had a perfect trip. She was up the wood and she just never went on. And I know Maurice is a nice horse over there. I just... If she can run the races back from 2015, her final race at Shots in that was a giant, giant race when she ran into Asia Nakari. If she can run that, she can win this race. I just don't know where she is form-wise and price-wise. For me, it's Lady Eli. It's probably a race I don't have anything as far as individual races concerned. Maybe I have some sort of a pick going on at this point. I believe it's the payoff leg of the pick five. But, um, yeah, I look sentimentally and logically, I, I think Lady Eli is the one to beat. I do agree she's the one to beat, but I, I kind of love Queen's Trust in here, and I think Lady Eli might have her hands full with both of these Euros, though I don't dispute the fact that she's a very likely winner, supposed to be doing very well, and will be on my tickets for sure. But uh, Queen's Trust, I think, ran a terrific race last time. Both Queen's Trust and Seventh Heaven were against the flow there. DeTori just rode the race brilliantly on Journey and didn't really give the horses coming from far back a fair chance to uh, to get anywhere near him at the end. Both Queen's Trust and Seventh Heaven had a little bit of trouble in running there. The reasons I prefer Queen's Trust basically comes, well, it comes down to price for one thing. Seventh Heaven, kind of a long-bodied horse who I could see finding trouble around a tight uh, two-turn configuration. Queen's Trust should be suited by the cutback and distance, I believe, and uh, – but I want to use I want to use all three of those. I, I just think that they're uh, when looking at what they've accomplished overseas and how good they are. Um, that that it, it's just going to be another great race on a Breeders' Cup card loaded with good races. But I have a feeling Queen's Trust is going to be a price you can just bet on the nose. It would be one of my bets of the of the weekend. Mike Hogan, how do you see this one? Chad Brown, exacta, box it up. Lady Eli, C. Khaleesi. Box it up. I'll, I'll even take a head-to-head straight over those those two euros, J.K., if you want to do another head-to-head in here. Excuse me? <laughs> no, I heard you. Yeah, no, 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 I heard you. That, that was one of those sarcastic excuses. The, 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 uh, the, the best finisher of the two Chad Browns over the best finisher of the two Europeans that you mentioned, the euros being uh, Queen's Trust and Seventh Heaven. What do you think? Done. Okay. Done. You know, so, right now you you owe me a twenty four hour. Uh, you owe me a twenty four hour. Uh, avatar. You know, be, avatar. Be, 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 because because your four to one beat my forty six to one by a length. Is that why? You, oh, okay. don't try to weasel out of it, Mike. <laughs> I'm not weaseling. Far. I'm not weaseling. <laughs> I'm just trying to make it clear. I'm just trying to make it clear what happened. Um, but yeah, I, I you know look, see Khaleesi, uh, she'll be a good price, and I think she'll be a little bit forgotten with the Euros with Lady Eli in there. She was completely against it last out. She had no chance. She might have even needed the race, and she ran on pretty well, only losing two lengths to Lady Eli. I think she'll move forward off that. She'll get a ton of pace to run at. I mean, Catch a Glimpse is going to be flying. You'll have Avenge out there gunning it. Al's Gal's got a little bit of speed as well. Zepesa has speed. Uh, Santiero Italia is not really going to be that far off. And even even Pretty Perfect uh, may be the rabbit in here for 7th Heaven. Seems like she's always at or near the lead. I think there's going to be a lot of pace to run at. Uh, it, it sets, I don't know if she's good enough, but you'll get a nice price on C. Khaleesi and she'll get exactly the setup that she needs. Um, so I like those two, uh, and, and, and I'll probably be using them on top of, uh, the two logical euros and the tries and the supers and, um, hope for the best. All right, let's move on to our final Breeders' Cup race. I'll say to the people who are listening live, this is going to be something we're doing from now on, going to be broadcasting the podcast live. The schedule that I think we're going to stick with normally is going to be Tuesdays and Fridays at 11 o'clock. For folks who are listening live now who found us through the magic of Spreaker or Twitter, we might have half a minute at the end of the show to answer a question or two. 
So if you want to, through Spreaker, ask us a question, perhaps we'll be able to get to that by the end. If not, maybe we can answer uh, later in some other forum. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Last race we're going to talk about is the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Mike, we'll keep it with you. What are your thoughts on this uh, on this small but interesting field? <clears throat> small but interesting in, in you know, I, I think kind of maybe not the most exciting of uh, Breeders' Cup Sprints that we've seen. Um, and, and, and I dare I say this field kind of pairs, pales in comparison to the one we had last year. Um, so with that in mind, I think, uh, I think masochistic is just the fastest horse in the race early. Uh, and he's going to be, <clears throat> he's going to be probably on the lead. Um, and he's probably going to be, um, you know, hang, tr- hanging on for dear life, uh, as they, as they turn for home and as they hit the wire. Um, I don't trust any of them. I mean, uh, you mentioned one of the favorite parts of, of yesterday's webinar with, with Andy Byer, perhaps my favorite part of any webinar we've done with Andy Byer was he tossed this whole race. He tossed every horse in the race. I don't None want of any of them. Can win. None of them can win. None of them can win. <laughs> um, which I, and I kind of see his point. Uh, that said, I mean, masochistic is coming into this race a lot better than he was at this time last year. He actually didn't run. I mean, sure. He finished last in that race, but the, the horses that he was chasing, uh, private zone run happy, even Holy boss, uh, there's nobody in here as fast as them early or as good as them late. Um, he could, he could just be faster than everybody. You pick the fastest horse and, and he, he's seemingly, uh, training incredibly well. Um, it's kind of a boring opinion cause he's the two to one favorite, but I think he's probably your most likely winner. Matt Bernier, where are you in the Breeders' Cup sprint? I, I guess, and I'm not even directing this to Mike. I, I don't understand the hate for this race. I know it's not the biggest field, but it's, I don't think these horses are bums. People are making it out mm. like these horses can't pick their feet up. I mean, AP Indian, all he's done is rip off, what, three consecutive giant, giant races, four consecutive giant races if you want. Lord Nelson's unbeaten at the distance. He's got four consecutive triple digits. Masochistic can break a land speed record if he wants. And then you've got a couple of three-year-olds that are moving up, whether it's Drayfong, who, again, at this point, looks like he could be anything. And, and no holding back, Bear's not a bum. I just, I guess, I, I don't understand the the vitriol for this race. I think it's an interesting race, and if these horses were all bummed, don't you think this would be a fourteen horse field? Instead, it's a seven horse field. The joking, not going to go because unfortunately got sick. Um, I look at this eight. race. I think speed is good. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, eight horses. Joking. Uh, eight. I'm sorry. You're right. We're joking now. Um, I look. I, I think there's going to be a. a Pretty hot pace signed on. You obviously you've got masochistic. You've got Delta Blues man. He's going to be there as well. AP Indian won't be far off. I, I think one of the opinions for me of the weekend is Lord Nelson. I've loved him in every one of his starts. I thought his San Anita sprint was a little bit workmanlike, but when you go back and look at it some more, if it was just simply a prep, which I kind of feel like it was, this is perfect. Baffert of all people knows how to handle a horse like this. He's proven from off the pace in the past. I just think this is a, a perfect setup for a horse like this who I, I, I don't know how they're going to bet the race, truly. I think that's the most intriguing thing as well. I, I feel like Lord Nelson yeah. could kind of fall through the cracks. I think he's 5-2 to two on the line. I, I, if he goes off at 7-2 to two or 4-1, to one, this may be the bet of the weekend for me. I like him quite a bit here. That's a good case. Uh, for me, this race, based on my performance in it last year, maybe I should just get the workout report, see who's supposed to be working the worst, and bet that one. Um, very, very difficult race. I like AP Indian. I've liked him for this race for a long time. I don't see a reason to get off of him. I could see him getting hammered to the point where it becomes more of a pass race for me, though. Um, but I will cast a vote for AP Indian. JK, how about you? Where are you in this one? Well, I, I agree with you, Pete. I love AP Indian, and, and, and my love for AP Indian has led me to my key horse and trifectas, and that's going to be Limousine Liberal. Um, you know, I, I think people say, oh, well, you know, it's just one race he ran well, and, and AP Indian wasn't cranked, and AP Indian was supposed to run the week before and had to ship in, and blah, blah. that's fine. All that could be true, but I think the important thing that you re- need to realize when you look at the running line is that Limousine Liberal added blinkers last time for the first time, and in my opinion, that was a difference. That's what moved him up. And I think the horse is going to run huge in this spot. He's drawn outside, which is a great place to be in a, in a, in a, in a field of, of nine horses. 
Uh, he's got tactical speed. He can see what everyone else is going to do. He'll get a good spot moving forward, and, and I think the horse will finish. And I think that he'll he'll be a big number, and, I, and I'm going to use him in tries. Like I said, I'm going to key him in every spot of the tries with the obvious horses like AP Indian um, and uh, and Lord Nelson. So uh, I, I really am looking forward to betting this horse. Seems maybe yeah, I, I agree, Jonathan. Masochistic out there, Jonathan. Was that, was that on purpose? <laughs> no, you know, to be honest with you, I got my, I just got my, I got my, my confidence crushed with masochistic, you know, going into last year into the sprint. I was a huge masochistic fan leading up to it, and and uh, our friend Nick Tamaro just abused me about being such a California fan, and then the horse ran awful. So he's, I'm kind of mad at him. I'm blaming him for 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 making me feel like an idiot. Uh, he'll be used for sure. I respect the horse a lot, and and um, and he's definitely one that uh, that I couldn't leave out, especially with my guy Mike riding. Mike, you had something else on this race? Yeah, yeah. I'll say I'll, I'll agree with uh, J.K. that uh, Limousine Liberal is absolutely the price horse I'd be interested in, uh, and, and I also think Masochistic is probably as likely a winner as he is to run last. Um, you know, I, and, and last year I think he was coming into the race maybe not quite the same form. If you forgive that prep and those two other uh, in that race itself, I mean, he's really done very, very little wrong, uh, you know, and he might just be the best horse, but I don't know how much I can trust him. I think that's, that's part of point and something folks should think about anytime they're constructing exotic tickets, especially in Breeders' Cup, but day in, day out as well. The, the concept of the horse who's a win or run out horse. And when yeah. you have a horse like that, I think it just, you know, it, it's pretty obvious, but I still think people don't always think about it like this. When you're constructing your vertical uh, wagers for the race, th- to me, that's the way you should play that horse. There's no reason right. not to just use a horse on top and leave out of second and third or use a horse maybe in your multis and maybe even more heavily in your multis, but then look to the exacta pool or even trifecta pool to try to beat a horse like that, especially if the crowd goes crazy betting. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Mike, and it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned that on a horse who you mark down as such a likely winner. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and then that's part of going back to Matt's point. It's not like I hate this race. I just don't, I don't feel like the, the horse that I feel like I have the strongest opinion in, I don't trust. And, and I think that's part of it. It's, uh, I don't really feel like I can trust anybody and there's nobody that I love in here. And you know, so I might just tread a little lightly. All right, let's spend the last couple of minutes just doing some housekeeping. Matt Bernier, you're going to go first. Let us know where we can find your always excellent coverage. Um, uh, video, audio, however you want to do it for all the Breeders' Cup stuff this weekend. How can folks get more of Matt Bernier? So this afternoon, we're going to tape betting the Breeders' Cup. We taped it last year from Keeneland. Seemed uh, a lot of people enjoyed it quite a bit. So we're going to tape that again this afternoon. It'll air, I believe, Thursday at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. And it'll also run each day, Friday and Saturday, before Breeders' Cup coverage on NBCSN begins. Um, Friday, will be live on NBCSN the entire day for all the Breeders' Cup races right through the Distaff Saturday, beginning with the Juvenile on NBCSN right through. Then they'll transition over to the Breeders' Cup Classic on NBC. Uh, And I'll also be doing, when I can, I know I'm doing the Classic, but I think I've got a couple other hits as well for uh, for the simulcast players show. So anybody that's in an OTB or they're playing from home, uh, we'll be on there as well. And then, obviously, we've got some other stuff going on tomorrow morning. We'll be doing this all over again, and we'll just be doing – Pete and I will kind of be flipping roles. We'll all just be driving traffic. Uh, and then we've got some videos to come up later on this afternoon. Uh, I say this afternoon. It'll be this morning here on the on the West Coast. Pete, I'll meet you out at the racetrack. JK, hopefully you're there. We'll tape some things. Mike Watchmaker, we'll tape some things with him as well. And um, I'll also be coming on DRF Live after the distaff in the classic to talk to Dan Elman and Mike Beer back in New York. So a lot of stuff going on this weekend, but obviously it's, it's all good stuff. It's Breeders Cup. How can it be good? DRF.com, your one-stop shop for all things related to the Breeders Cup. If you want more Jonathan Kinchin, sign up for his uh, Snapchat or, you know, however that works. Uh, Mike Hogan, how about uh, the rest of the stuff you're going to be doing? I'll be joining you for a bunch of it. What can folks be looking forward to? Well, up ne- if you're listening live, up next at 1.30 uh, Eastern time today, 10.30 on the West Coast, uh, Mike Watchmaker will be joining uh, f- the first part of the webinar uh, on the Breeders' Cup. We'll be going through some of the races, his strongest opinions. And then halfway through at the top of the hour at 11 o'clock, uh, Randy Moss will be joining uh, he's got a lot of things going on with his NBC Sports. I'm sure, Matt, you can relate. 
uh, schedule. So he can't join until 11. So we're going to, we're going to have one come in. We're going to do the, the, the tag team handoff, um, watchmaker and Randy Moss. Uh, that should be really fun. And then later in the afternoon, 4 PM Eastern, one o'clock Pacific Pete, I think you'll be joining when Dan Illman and Mike beer go over their selections in a, in a live webinar as well. Should be so that should be fun. And then yep. tomorrow we got the Matt Bernier show going to be 11 yep. Eastern, just like this show was. And then a webinar later in the day. What time is the, is the afternoon webinar uh, tomorrow? That one's at one o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. on the West Coast. So and we will be joined uh, we, by Mike Beshi and yep. uh, who else is joining? And Jay, that one? And Jay, Jay Priven. Oh, fantastic. Another, another NBC Sports uh, shout out. Perhaps a special guest in there as well, depending on how things break. But that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank my table mate, Jonathan Kinchin. I want to thank special guest Matt Bernier. Matt, always a pleasure to have you on. I want to thank Mike Hogan, doing such a great job keeping all this Breeders' Cup Week coverage together, organizing these webinars and podcasts. Most of all, I want to thank all of you for listening and downloading. I'm going to get a chance to say this uh, again tomorrow, but may you win all your Breeders' Cup photos. 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 Photos.